Welcome to Paintbrush and Ivories, the podcast for artists and curious creatives that connects creativity with the heart and soul. I'm Michelle Walker, and I'm here with my creative soul sister, Jennifer Ruth Russell. Hello, hello. I am so excited to be here today. (laughs) Wonderful to be connecting. Now, I noticed that when we spoke on our first episode, we didn't talk about where in the world we are. So Jennifer, tell us, where are you calling from? Where are we connecting to? Well, I am in a small town called Tahunga, California, which is in Los Angeles County. So it's not small at all. No. <laughs> in the metropolitan sense. <laughs> I'm from Los Angeles. And I'm at the other end of the spectrum. I'm on a farm, which is 170 acres, and we're about three hours from the nearest capital city. So I'm just, for the locals in Australia listening, I'm inland from Byron Bay near the village of Nimbin. So there we are. We've anchored ourselves geographically. This is episode two. It's kind of exciting. We want to talk about our creative journey and spark some thinking for the listeners to reflect on their creative journey. And I know that there's no one type of a creative journey. There's so many different ways that we can enter into our creative path. So that's what we're going to talk about today. I'm excited because this is actually a really powerful conversation to reflect on this. What do you think? Oh, I think it's wonderful. You know, as, as I've been preparing for this, I'm amazed at how there are moments in time. One moment can be such a life changer. Yeah, I agree. So part of our um, backdrop for me about this conversation was, I love this quote, which is every child's an artist and the problem is staying an artist when you grow up. And I feel that there's a aspect of that to what we're going to be talking about and and that may be true for people that are listening in so that quote from Picasso sort of provides a really good foundation for the conversation that we're going to have so I'd love to ask you the first question that I had on my mind was just give us a sense of when you first really encountered your creative self I love this question and I, I can't wait to hear your answer to this question I was raised in Ethiopia, which is East Africa. And my parents and my grandparents were missionaries. It was very simple. There was no radio or television or any kind of outside input. So we had a lot of music in my home and yet we were out in the boonies. I remember we only had electricity for like two hours a night and all the records that we played were very fast, you know. So when we came to the States and heard them for real, they sound like, oh, they're so slow. They sound in the lower key. You know, it was really strange. But when I was six, actually, there was no English speaking school. So I was sent away to a school in the capital, Addis Ababa, to join other missionary kids. My family was very musical, you know, especially my mom. And everyone in the school, we just did a lot of music together. But I remember this moment in time, and it was the first year that we were able to actually live on campus. The school was called Good Shepherd School. And there was a big U in the school. Uh, the, The boys stayed on one side, the girls on the other side. And at the end of both sides of this U was like our meeting hall. And there was a piano in there. And we would sing in there and we'd have guests come in and share music. And there was one moment in time, and I wish I could tell you exactly what happened. It's just a sense that I became aware that people were looking at me because I was doing something that was a little bit maybe unusual in the musical sense. I was playing and singing mm-hmm. and I became self-conscious oh, wow. about music. It was really I look back at it as a really wonderful thing, although it kind of made me, as a child, you don't really look at yourself, but it was one of the first times that I looked at myself. I love that. (laughs) How about you? What was your first sense of your creative self? I was casting my, my mind back to, like you, I had a family that was, both my mom and my dad were fairly creative in their own way. And... I grew up, they weren't together when I grew up. So I used to spend time, I was raised by my dad, but I used to spend time with my mum. And so creativity was always sort of present in, a, in an aspect, as was nature and the environment. They were sort of like the two backdrops for me. But I remember a time when I was about five and I could do anything at home at my dad's place. Like I could muck around, paints, drawing, whatever. And um, I just remember this time when I was on holidays with my mum 
So for those who are local in Australia, Lamington National Park was a big part of my growing up. I spent a lot of my school holidays at Lamington National Park and my mum used to go to the Binnaburra side. My dad used to go to the O'Reilly side. <laughs> and that makes sense. They're the two sort of separate resorts within the national park. And my, on the Binnaburra side, Roma Groom was a lady who was the aunt of the people that ran the resort and she had a pottery studio. And I remember her showing me how to center a lump of clay on a wheel. And I was really quite young. So I'm, I'm, my memory was that I was about five and she just showed me how to do it. And I just did it. And I remember her looking at me and going, that's amazing that you can just do that. And I remember thinking, oh, I can. It just felt so natural. Clay and mud has always been a joy of my life. Um, I love playing with that stuff and I am a bit fearless with it, although I've never gone into having my own kiln or any of that. So there was that moment where that lady who was very competent, so she had a pottery studio down the hill from the lodge at the resort and she sold her pottery and it was, you know, used in the lodge and, and she just sort of recognised this capacity and I remember thinking, yeah, I love that. I love that I can do that and I could. I, you know, a lot of people struggle as, as kind of who come to pottery, that's sort of one of the tricks with wheel throwing. So that was my first sense of myself as a creative. That, that is so cool. That is so awesome. I, I remember playing with mud when I was a kid too. We had a banana grove and I would go down there and create little villages and little pathways in the mud. Uh, and we had great mud, you know, it was just so great. I mean, it just hung together perfectly. That's, I love that story. How is creativity viewed in, in your family? Well, it sounds like we both had fairly creative families. So my both my mum and my dad, so my dad was a carpenter and he used to do whittling and, and carving in timber. And mum was a seamstress all her life and she was also a musician. So she played piano. And then when I was, maybe before I got into my teen years, she went as a teacher, she went and specialised as a music teacher. So in you know, when she was about mid thirties, she just went and learnt all these instruments. So from having a bass in keyboards, she went and she could play something like 15 instruments and she used to teach music and she became a specialist teacher. And music was just never part of my comfort zone, if you like, but whistling sticks with my dad. Yep. Playing in mud and clay and stuff like that. Yep. Drawing, painting, all that sort of stuff. So it was fairly accepted as something that one does well we had um when we were home we had devotions every night okay so that was a time that we would sing we would get out the instruments and you know my mom would play that stride piano kind of like by ear my dad would sing but he wasn't he never thought of himself as musical um, or creative which is interesting um, but all of us kids played something. I have, my oldest sister has cerebral palsy and the use of only one hand. And I'm what I, I was wondering, I think that's why she played the trumpet. So she and my older brother played the trumpet. Then, uh, my sister that's just older than I am and myself, we, we, we were called the girls in the middle. We played the piano and sang. And then the youngsters, cause there's two younger, there's six kids in our family. They didn't do anything. It's really interesting. Uh, so Beth and I, the two in the middle, we did a lot of music. And then, of course, at school, when we went away to the school, everybody did music. So we did musicals every year. We, you know, we did plays. We sang in choirs. I, I am jealous for a lot of people, like kids here in the Los Angeles School District. They have to fight to even have music. I mean, kids are not singing anymore. That really makes me sad. I used to run a mile from the school musical. That was my... <laughs> Keep away from that. <laughs> My worst nightmare, the idea of it, generally. Singing in public, yes. Um, I don't have a fear of speaking in public, but singing in public, yeah. I'm curious, who have been some of the people that have influenced you in your sort of life around creativity? Mm, you know, I'm going to tell you about another moment in time um, because a lot of times I haven't had any... Uh, when, when you ask me that question, I don't think of any one person. But I remember I was in junior high, and we happened to be here in the United States for a year. 
And I was, I'd gone with my sister to one of her friend's house and I sat down at the piano and I started playing an old hymn that I knew pretty well. And I decided to just do something different with it. And I had never done that before. So I must have been 13, maybe 12, 13. And I got this nostalgic feeling in my body, like, ooh, I, I'm doing something that makes me feel like I, I'm an ancient creature. I am, I am connected to something way beyond what my own understanding. But I started making up the song in different ways. And this girl was so impressed with me. Kind of like, but she had no credentials. She was just a girl. But it was like a memory that so stands out. It was one of those moments in time. You know, like, this is fun. What is this? I want to do more of this. Isn't that interesting how it was bodily sensation for you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I still get that. I, I could be sitting at the piano writing and all of a sudden I get just a, a feeling in my body and my third eye starts there. I feel pressure actually right in my third eye. Very interesting. I went to Dick Grove School of Music. So he influenced me a lot and, and his cronies that taught there. That was when I knew that I was really going to do music as a living and as well as a passion. And the, the moment in time that I decided that I was flying for Delta Airlines and we were having a layover in Cincinnati, Ohio and decided to go get some drinks in the boom, boom room. <laughs> it must've been a holiday in something, right? <laughs> so I think we probably had some shots of tequila and I went up and I <laughs> sang with the band. <laughs> I, I went and sang it with the band and my dear friend, who's still a dear friend of mine was there and she goes, you should do this. And I was like, yes, Ooh. I should. So the Boom Boom Room in Cincinnati, Ohio was one of those other moments in time that, wow, okay. And I did. And I went then to start studying and I went to Dick Grove School of Music, which was a trade school for musicians here in LA. And how old were you then yeah. when you had the Boom Boom Room in Cincinnati? Well, That's I good. was in my mid, mid 20s, I think. Yeah. I mid 20s. I flew for Delta for like five years until I had... Um, my son. And then I decided I couldn't do that. I couldn't do the separation thing. And then it was like, okay, now it's time to get serious about what I really want to do. And I decided to go to school and, and really learn my trade seriously. <laughs> Fantastic. I love the idea of it being a trade school <laughs> for tradies, a musician yeah. tradie school. Yeah. Well, I didn't get the insight until much later in life. It's interesting. When I went to high school, we get to junior and that's you're about 15 and you have to make a decision about how you're going to spend the last two years of your school and you specialize. And I did in junior, I did art, I did language, I did geography, I did science. I loved it all. You know, I'm just a, I'm a bit of a lifelong learner, but we had this interview. So it was my parents, it was actually my dad and my second mum and myself with my form teacher and he said to my parents, not so much to me, but to my parents, if she's good at all of it, get her to do the science because she'll get a better entry school for her university years. So the school that I went to was both academic and sporting and had a good performing arts side of it as well. So it was a pretty good school. But <laughs> When they said that, I just rolled up in senior and I did English, Mass 1, Mass 2, Biology, Chemistry, Physics, boom, full on science. And, you know, it was, it was a bit of a, it was a bit of a priority and a bit of the reality was do well in those or do half decent in those subjects and you'll do better than if you do outstanding in the arts. And I find that still deeply sad. It's really, a, you know, that snobbery around science, more important or more serious than mm -hmm. arts and i think it's slowly changing but not as much maybe and not as far so that was why i ended up specializing in science and i stepped off out of school into university life and did a science degree so my base was science but in my science degree i did as many as i could in the arts faculty that i was allowed to to get my science degree so i did language and i did psychology and i did anthropology and archaeology so they were all in the arts but it wasn't fine art it was more the arts and i left university and was kind of looking down the barrel of an honors year 
and I just couldn't get started. I couldn't get enthusiastic. I couldn't, my energy was flat. Every time I turned up to uni to go <laughs> to do some background research, I found myself at the pool and I figured there was something in that. And I drove home via what used to be called the Commonwealth Employment Services. So this is going back a ways. And I'm talking the mid eighties. And I just called in for a lark to see if there were any jobs. And there was a job there for a photographer's assistant. And I just did this 90 degree turn. I went and applied for the job. I got the job. You know, there was a moment where science, yes, then arts. And I played in that field, film, photography, video production. I did that for five years. And I went overseas. I traveled. I lived in England working in, in TV and film. But on the side, I always had this love and passion of the environment. And so I kind of kept that going. I used to do volunteer work for Friends of the Earth at the Camden Lock Markets in London and run a stall there and talk to people about rainforest and the Amazon clearing and all those sorts of big hard hitting issues. And then I, my life did another 90 degree turn. I left work in London and found myself back in Australia for a holiday, what I thought was gonna be a six week holiday. And that turned into a 20 year career. And while I was in Australia, I had the Gulf War broke out and I had a flight through Afghanistan and I decided maybe not, maybe I'd stay put in Australia for a little while while that all settled down. And while I was staying put, I got a, a casual job with national parks and I sort of flipped again. So then I was working in my science area and loving it and did that, you know, career for 15 years in the environment. And so I have literally flipped 90 degrees back between science and arts. And the last, mm -hmm. the last sort of turn was 2005. I started working for myself as a facilitation and environmental planning consultant and took myself off to art school and could not believe how much joy I had in sitting in that library in that art school and just being surrounded by those books. And I honestly thought I'd died and gone to heaven. I was having so much fun. So I've since engineered a career that is more in the middle of those two things. And more lately, I've just given up and gone into the studio to paint and make jewelry. <laughs> so a couple of a couple of key turning points, you know, but I think my whole life is categorized by this, you know, science or arts was how it was fed to me. And my joy is science and arts. So now, even in my painting, I'm painting about what mm -hmm. I care about, which is the environment, which I spent, you know, 15 plus years in my professional career working as an environmental planner. Oh, yes. I love your art that you're doing now. It's just, it's, it's so, um, it, it, it comes through so clearly that the love of the earth and, uh, and it's mostly from an aerial point of view, which I find is fascinating. I think that's the planner yeah. in me. You know, I spent years looking at maps mm -hmm. and looking at values on maps and infrastructure on maps. And maybe I'm just part eagle as well. I've got that kind of capacity <laughs> to look from the from the air down. So I think, yes. you know, the, the sort of idea of creativity being central to my life, that occurred very much in a sort of a certain point in time. What about for you? Did that, was that something that you've had a sense of that all your life? You know, it's something I really took for granted, I think, as I was coming up through the years, taking it for granted in that it was easy for me. And um, when I met Michael Gale, who is now my beloved partner and producer, uh, everything changed because I realized that you could record things, right? I didn't even have a sense of it. I just was loving writing songs and writing songs for any situation in my life because that's what I do. A song always is an expression of what I'm learning, especially spiritually. I write songs because I want to grab something spiritual and I want it to stick. We were creating music together and recording, and I went to a, a weekend for the virtues and I had no idea but somebody invited me and it's the first time that I ever got a divine directive and I was to write the virtue songs which was to go with this book called the family virtues guide there were 52 songs in there wow. and I really heard Jennifer you need to write a song for each one of these chapters so I went home and Michael and I had just gotten our studio together and I said would you help me 
because somebody ordered them for their Sunday school classes. So I had to get them done in an orderly fashion. Thank God he said yes. So the next <laughs> year and a half, we spent wow. putting out like a song and a half a week so we could get them done in, in a year and a half. And, and uh, that was wonderful because it, I think it was called the Church of Religious Science. And they ordered every single of their, one of their spiritual centers ordered these songs, which is great. I want to just say that the next big thing that happened to me as far as my music was, that experience took creativity off of the shelf for me. It was like, it's not just something to do when it falls, you know, the, the apple falls from the tree and I'm happy to be sitting under it. I had to create and it was great because it was just like this endless supply. I think of creativity as a river that flows under the earth and you can just dip into it anytime you need to and bring it up. And that's what that taught me. And a few years later, it was, I think in 2003, I was on a silent retreat with Reverend Mark, Michael Bernard Beckwith at Agape, which is a, a big spiritual center here in LA. And I love being silent for three days, although it drove me crazy at the same time, you know, because you have to go through that resistance of like, I have so much to say, my mind is like, blah, 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 blah. And I wasn't, you know, and we we're on getting and it was a New Year's retreat. So we're almost getting there to the New Year's Eve and everybody's coming up with all these. I mean, you know, you could tell people were getting insights. And I was like, nothing, nothing, nothing. I'm just having a blank inside my head. And all of a sudden, this phrase just dropped in. You are the song of God. I went into a watershed of tears. I could not even speak that phrase for another five, six years because it was so profound for me, like the deepest recognition of my artistry that I've ever received. Yeah. And now I, I realize really, really clearly that that is my gift to give yeah. and that we're not here to get anything from this world. We're here to bring our gifts <laughs> and yeah. the universe will always take care of us. So. That was a very important insight for me. And now I can say, and I'm saying here on this podcast with you, Michelle, yep. I am the song of God. Yeah. And the, and the truth is, I know that you are as well. And so is everybody listening. <laughs> oh, that those times when we see another layer or in a more, greater depth or maybe even the infinite nature of ourselves is such a beautiful thing. And I love that story. I was thinking about what happened for me. I had a personal kind of, you know, the old sliding doors, the idea of sliding doors as a concept. And now it's now in popular culture, but I had one of those moments in 2002, which goodness is now a long, a lot of years ago. But at that time I was, within the sort of space of 24 hours, I went from being in a relationship, trying to start a family, trying to get pregnant to start that family, building a house with that person to 24 hours later, not, not any of that. And it really brought a question to me, which is how do I find happiness? What brings joy to my heart? And I pondered an inquiry about that question as I was going through a fairly painful breakup. And what came up was two things, actually three, travel, and I wanted to travel on my own. Language, I wanted to go and study language in country, so in the culture where it's spoken. And I wanted to dip my toe in the water with creativity. And in particular with jewelry making, because I'd been a, I'd been beading for years, but I could never get the silver bit that I wanted you know, kind of when you're buying someone else's ready-mades. And so I wanted to go and investigate what was it like to play with metal. And so I booked myself into a Spanish speaking college in Barcelona for uh, a number of months. And before I left to go to Europe, I took myself off to a 10 day silversmithing introductory class that was a live-in residential school. And on the morning of the second day, I went, hell yes. There was everything about this I want to do more of. And mm. so I took myself off to Barcelona. And the year that I was there, which was 2003, was Año de Diseño, which was the year of design. So everywhere I looked in Barcelona were these amazing design exhibitions and 
expo things for me to go and look at. And so the time I was there, I just drew and designed and, you know, came up with lots of things. So I came back to Australia after six months and just said, okay, I'm only working part time. I'm going to spend two days a week in my jewelry studio and I'll work for three days. And that went on for a couple of years. And in 2005, I decided to go back and I got a chance to go to art college. And my greatest fear in going to art college, which picks up on your metaphor of dipping into the river, was I thought I would run out of ideas. And so mm -hmm. I was actually quite anxious about that. And I remember going to a talk in my first year by an incredible um, artist, Tracy Moffat, and she said in that presentation, don't worry about not having enough ideas. You're going to have too many. They're going to keep you awake mm -hmm. at night. They're going to hassle you while you're having your shower in the morning, while you're eating your breakfast. It's really the trick is to only pay attention to the ideas that will not leave you alone. It's not a worry about not having enough. It's actually the other. And that really lifted a lid on something for me. And it's truly been my experience is that the more time and space I allow for my creativity, the more there is to do and to mm -hmm. explore and to play with. So I totally agree with the deep river that is for us there to dip into at any time. Absolutely. Wow. I love hearing your stories. Because <laughs> <laughs> although we've known each other for a while, we haven't really talked about this in this way, have we? Yeah. And I think there's a whole other um, episode here about the balance between science and, and creativity or just living in creativity, you know, because it is it is the juice, right? Creativity yeah. is the juice yeah. that makes everything else doable. Yes. And there's definitely another episode where we talk about what our limiting beliefs have been <laughs> and how we've let yes. go of them. <laughs> All right. I, I have another question for you, which interests me, and maybe it might be our last for this episode. How is it different now in how you see your life and your creativity today from, say, how you saw it 10, 15 years ago? Has there been much of a change or have you been in a groove for that long? What's what's your story? You know, when you ask me that question, the first thing that comes up is I've let go of trying to win a Grammy and to become, uh, you know, one of the top in the Billboard charts. That pressure has just it's not even part of my reality anymore and in fact I remember saying to Michael last year I said you know I'm declaring myself I'm not a recording artist anymore I want to just play and that really is how I feel about it it's like the seriousness of getting the perfect recording has left me so it's like the juice has increased because now I'm I'm doing these morning light meditations which always has music in it but also the meditations themselves are very creative for me. So it's like, what is up now? It's more that it's come into the now for me. I think that was, that is what I have to say is the most biggest change in the last maybe five years. Yeah. Because as a, as a working musician, especially here in LA, because I used to be a working musician playing out five nights a week, you have to stay really on top of the game of performance. And I think that it's very valuable. But then there comes a time when it has to be something more than that. Yeah. I remember Miles Davis quit playing for like, I think it was about five years. He just didn't pick up his horn at all until Cicely Tyson, bless her heart, she just made, just shuffled off the mortal coil, mm. coil um, came and said, you must play. You just have to play. But you know that it was like that's, that pause that brought some more richness to the whole experience. It's not just about being great, being perfect when you play something or putting out another hit song. It's really about what does my soul want to say? So I think that's the biggest difference. How about you? I feel like I've landed in the last year as to what my soul wants to say. And I want to honor uh, nature and Mother Earth and our connection to it and our, our place in it, you know, our connection as a species amongst many other species on this planet. And just the divinity of that, that the sort of beauty of that. And I'm now allowing myself for that to be at the center of my world. That's probably the biggest change and has brought the greatest amount of joy, incredible amount of joy. Mm -hmm. And I feel that 
you know, I'm in a very fortunate position. I feel very blessed that I've had a career that I love and I managed to move that career sort of sideways ever, ever gently, ever gently into more and more creative spaces. So I spent the last decade in my working life, I'm still working as an artist, but you know, in my consultant life, specializing in graphic facilitation, which might be a weird thing. And I'll put some links in the show notes, but it basically means I hold space for people to do work in groups and I use Mm -hmm. all the creativity that I can muster and encourage out of my participants. So they do the best work that they can. And I feel that that was a midway point. You know, I kind of came out of an arts degree with my consultancy and they were like two circles with not much in the middle. And I wanted to know what was the overlap between those two endeavors and areas of passion. And when I did that, I found a 10 year career of specializing in that kind of in that work. And that was great, but I still, I've shifted even further into just pure expression and the joy of expression. And it was about two years ago now that I asked the question, what if I put my art right in the middle of my world? What would then happen? And lots of things happened of, you know, out of interest, they did. And I was already in that mode when the pandemic hit. So I was happily busy in my studio, not lamenting the lack of work, although there was an issue around that, but I just feel like it was a gentle easing into what I'm doing this year, which is definitely more thoughtfully and intentionally really embracing the studio work and the expression and finding, you know, I've still got a lot of exploration to do. I'm really looking for what I want to say, but I've got the big picture, you know, and I guess mine for the next little while is just to explore different paths of, of that big picture for myself and for people who enjoy my work. Mm -hmm. So awesome. You know, when you're saying that reminds me too of this kind of journey that I've had with my spiritual leadership and music because I have really wanted to bring them together and now they have come together just so beautifully but I remember thinking of them as separate and then realizing no they are really a complement to each other and almost brought out I think in me the ceremonial master you know yes that is to me the the uh using of both of those spiritual mentorship and the music together. It's just delicious for me. I love it. Yeah. And I feel similar to you. And this is one of the parts of life that we share is that my spiritual practice is a deep aspect to my creativity and my creativity is a deep aspect of my spiritual practice. They are one and the same. And Mm -hmm. my joy and my passion is also linked with my creativity and my spiritual practice. They're they're sort of their frequencies. And I, I just, I get excited when I think about that. I get excited when I get to share with others how to step onto their creative path. I find that very uplifting. I did become aware about a decade ago that, you know, this is a phrase that you use all the time, which I love, which is what is mine to do. And one of the things that is mine to do is to help connect others with their deep wellspring of creativity that I know they have. But a lot of people have been taught to loosen that, to step away from that, that it's not professional, it's not grown up, which kind of links back to my quote from Picasso about every child yes. an artist. Is really, oh, I want to say it again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, a, it's that thing of really reconnecting people to that essence and that aspect of themselves as a creative mm-hmm. self. Because there's lots of things in our society and our community that teaches us that we're not. And it's, I don't believe it's true. I believe there is an artist in every soul that's here. We are mm-hmm. by our very nature creative. We're a creative force in this space. But that's for another longer yeah. conversation, I can tell. <laughs> yes, yes. Everyone is a singer. <laughs> so, so open up our mouths and, and uh, give thanks, right? Yeah. Make a joyful noise. It doesn't matter if it's only one note, if your song is only one note. That's not the point. No, no. Every child is an artist. The problem is staying an artist when you grow up. Pablo Picasso. Oh, beautiful. That's been a really interesting conversation to hear about your journey, Jennifer. And I feel that there is such a difference. You know, I think the whole music versus visual arts, you know, the performing arts, that, that sort of aspect is the difference. But there's a lot of commonality as well in terms of 
us growing into this and having early recognition of ourselves as creative, but maybe coming to it middle of our lives or, you know, I think of myself in the middle of my life. So I'm still embracing all of that and expanding to more of it. What a great conversation today about our creative journeys. And I'm hoping that those who listen into this podcast might reflect back on what's true for them and whether they've had any similarities with either of our stories or their story is totally different. I think there's something really valuable in anchoring into our creative selves and the story of our creative self and just appreciating what we've done on our creative journey already. That can be a really good backdrop, can't it, to where you might want to go to next. Absolutely. So wrapping up, thank you so much for chatting with me, Jennifer. It's been an absolute delight. Yes, it has. It's been great. Thank you. So thanks, everyone, for listening. Bye for now. Bye.